Hello and welcome to another live stream. Uh, hopefully some people will have some time to log on. I know currently in Canada, we're actually having the Canadian Society of Respiratory uh, Therapy Conference. Uh, most of the sessions I'm hoping are done by now and some people will have some time to stop by. Um, but I have a very special guest today and I'm going to actually discuss um, sort of a little bit about how this special guest became, well, special to me anyways. Uh, he may have a difference of opinion about myself, but uh, we're going to talk with um, Mr. Dean Hess, or uh, some people will call him Professor Dean Hess. I now can call him Dean, I think, after this many years. So welcome, Dean, uh, to my little broadcast here. Thomas, glad to join you. Happy to join you. Excellent. Glad to be able to join you, however you say that. Yeah. So basically, we're here today. And what I wanted to plan to do is really just talk about really the legacy of uh, Bob Kazmarek. And I mean, I think anybody tuning in probably because I posted that that's what we would be talking about. Hopefully they know and understand um, the impact that he had. But I honestly feel sometimes that maybe not every respiratory therapist that has seen him speak, for example, actually knows the impact he's had globally. Like this is not just an American known respiratory therapist. Um, and maybe you can speak a little bit about um, how widespread his influence really has been, because I know it. But, you know, let's let's hear it from you as well. Sure. Uh, Bob is uh, I, I think there's no question uh, that Bob was the best known respiratory therapist anywhere in the world. Certainly he was well known throughout the United States. He was well known in your country and Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he may have spoken a number of times at the yep. Canadian Society for Respiratory Therapy uh, meeting, which I'm happy to say I was able to speak at a few times uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so Bob was known uh, north of the border. He was known south of the border. So he was known in Mexico. Uh, Bob and I together lectured a number of times in Mexico, uh, a little bit of a funny story about that. We were once together in Mexico City and we were at the reception in the evening where everyone was having a cocktail or a wine or a beer and somebody came up to me and said, are you Dean Kazmarek or Bob <laughs> <laughs> so, so they had Bob they had the right idea. <laughs> so Bob and I looked at one another, shrugged our shoulders, and just went with it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so for the rest of the night, you were Dean Kazmarek and he was Bob Hess. And and in fact, uh, I have had experiences at the AARC Congress, walking through the hall uh, uh, quickly, briskly from one spot to another, and someone moved past me, and they would go. Hi, Bob. And I'm sure that Bob got some high deans sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, but I, you know, I always I always took that as a compliment. I don't know how Bob felt about it. Yeah. Uh, but Bob was certainly known in South America. Bob uh, uh, had a fiance uh, who was a or is, I should say, a Brazilian respiratory physiotherapist. In South Which are America. basically RTs in Brazil, right? They're, they, exactly. they train so what I was yeah. going to say is that in South America, the physical therapist, after they complete their training, uh, do a specialty. And one of the specialties that they can do is respiratory care. And the persons, the PTs who finish that training, essentially function as respiratory therapists in North America. And I've been there and visited with them and been in the ICU with them. And they uh, do ventilator management. They do aerosol delivery. Some of them draw arterial blood gases. They function very much the way that we uh, function in North America. Uh, Bob went, went to, uh, had a big impact in that practice dating back probably 30 years. When, when I first came to work at the Mass General in 1992, Bob would go off to Brazil and Argentina, and he would do, uh, he would do days-long presentations for physiotherapists to train them in respiratory care. Yeah. And in fact, yeah, he really... <clears throat> Go ahead. I was just going to say on what there was. So about 
uh, I don't know exactly the year, seven, eight years ago, something like that, Bob and I were both invited to a meeting in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And that's where Bob met his his fiance. So you were you were going to say something, Thomas, or I can continue to babble on. Yeah, about no, please. No, actually, I'll just yeah, no, go ahead, because so far we've just made it U.S. and then South. So let's right, right, talk right, about right. other so, hemispheres. So Bob, uh, Bob was also very influential in uh, in in Asia. Uh, Bob had uh, a number of research fellows from Japan and from China, uh, very, very well-known uh, Japanese intensivist is mm -hmm. uh, Masaji Nishimura. Yep. And uh, Masaji- yeah, I've, met, I've, I've met him at the, the, the journal conference we had together. Yes, 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 and <clears throat> exactly, and Mas Masaji, uh, was Bob's research fellow when I came to the MGH in 1992. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and there have been a number of Japanese and other uh, fellows from Japan and China over uh, the years. The they are extremely respectful and 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 like really respectful of uh, Bob. I remember even at that event, I think um, he was referring to Bob as professor uh, like the, almost the entire time we were there. Like it's a very, uh, you know, has a very prestigious role for them after they've been his correct. basically their mentor, right? That's right. Uh, and uh, you, I believe, may know Yuji Fujina. Uh, I think that is his name, who who worked with uh, one of your fellows in Toronto. Probably Takeshi uh, Yoshida. Yeah, did he work yes, with Takeshi? Exactly. Yeah. I think Yoshida is uh, on faculty with, uh, yeah, I think it's Yuji. Uh, I think he I mentioned think that his, so his boss, essentially, I think he said did training with Bob Kazmarek. I'm not mistaken. That's, that's right. So, yeah. So my apologies if I got sort of the names wrong, but there is that kind of a relationship. Yeah. Regarding South America, I should probably also point out that Bob was a collaborator and friend of, uh, of uh, Amato. So, uh, yeah, Marcelo Amato, yeah. Marcelo Amato <laughs> and Bob collaborated for, for many years uh yeah and early on i mean professor amato um he he was really doing a lot of the i mean he was probably one of the first i would argue to publish a you know a um you know trying to individualize peep using the pressure volume curves he had a yeah. very classic paper i think it was was it 88 or was it 98 no it was 98 it was two years yeah, prior to the arts trial 1990s it was in the blue journal yeah uh, yeah so 1998 he had that pressure volume curve study and then right. you know what i remember doing a talk um when the they when they published the alveoli trial which was the sort of the follow-up to ardsnet the high versus low peep table i remember in the first arma trial 2000 New England Journal of Medicine six versus 12 mils per kilo i remember in the discussion they mentioned that perhaps higher peep would also be beneficial. And they actually reference his paper from 98, from two years prior in that article. And then what's interesting is four years later, they published the alveoli trial and it showed no difference, high versus low peep table. And I remember having a slide of those results and then also a talk or a, a slide of Marcelo's paper showing pressure volume curve. And then I have a graph of a, a point on a, on a slide and an arrow like missing the point. Um, because my, <laughs> what I was trying to explain is that what Marcelo was really trying to do was individualize PEEP, and they decided to test high versus low PEEP, again, arbitrary high and arbitrarily low settings of PEEP, and I felt that they missed the point because they really had an opportunity at that moment to start this process of different methods of individualizing PEEP instead of just cookie-cutter approach to PEEP. So I really felt like they missed the point uh, with Marcelo's work, but... But you're right. Bob's been involved with with those with that entire yeah, yeah. group I, for so long. I mean, back in the I can tell you, 20 years ago uh, at the at the MGH, influenced by Amato's work in the PV curve, 
uh, we could be seen and I could be seen uh, going into the ICU with a big calibration syringe. <laughs> the super and, syringe uh, method. Yeah. Filter on it and, uh, and uh, aneroid pressure manometer and we would do step changes in volume and plot out the pressure volume curve. Uh, and then uh, six different people would look at it and come up with six different wh what they thought was the ideal level of PEEP. And yeah. that led to, to a paper that I actually uh, was a co-author on with uh, Jose Venegas and, uh, and Scott Harris back about 2000, where we came up with some uh, curve fitting uh, approaches to the pressure volume curve and trying to be a little bit uh, precise uh, about how to, to use that. Mm -hmm. But continuing with Bob's journey around the world, mm -hmm. <laughs> Bob was also uh, very influential in Europe. So mm -hmm. Bob collab has collaborated for many years with Jesus Villar in Spain. Uh, more recently has collaborated Luis with uh, Luis Blanche, yeah. uh, uh, also from Spain, from Barcelona. For many, many, many years, Bob spoke every year at the Brussels meeting. And right. I, uh, I was, I felt privileged to have been invited to present there one time. Bob presented <laughs> there every Bob time. was on the routine, the routine <laughs> roster, was he? <laughs> Bob was on the route and made a, and made a big, uh, and, and made a uh, sort of a, a big splash uh, at that meeting every year. Uh, yeah. it, one of the things about Bob, uh, anybody who who ever heard him lecture, is he was he was a very uh, good presenter from yeah. the podium. So uh, Bob would fill the room everywhere he went, uh, and Bob also uh, uh, presented in uh, in Egypt. I know a number of times. Uh, so, and, uh, you know, back in Asia, he's been, I know he's been to Taiwan. So Bob really was influential around the world. He influenced the careers of a lot of people. Yep. And perhaps the important thing to say about that is that by influencing the careers of a lot of people, teaching a lot of people, uh, good approaches, evidence-based approaches to respiratory care and mechanical ventilation certainly resulted in good care for lots of patients, good outcomes for lots Absolutely. of patients. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about how he influenced me as a, you know, Canadian RT um, and really yourself. So when, when it, when it came down to me sort of starting my foray into understanding evidence-based practice for respiratory care, it really came down to me starting to read papers and particularly in respiratory care, um, because it seemed like an easy transition from never reading research to something that obviously is very relatable to what I do. Interestingly enough, most people may not, if they don't journal beyond respiratory care, they may not realize that there are many journals that really do, for instance, the Blue Journal, that really do focus on a lot of what RTs do. But a lot of the publications in the Blue Journal don't involve a lot of RTs a lot of the time, uh, although I'm sure you could find your name and Bob's name in many of the articles in the Blue Journal. Um, but really what started me off was uh, I remember um, I worked with a physician, uh, again, world-renowned critical care physician, not necessarily for mechanical ventilation, but for critical care in general, and that's Dr. Deborah Cook. And she's probably one of the most published female physicians in critical care in the world. And I worked with her at St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton. And I remember we, um, I had read the paper by uh, Danny Talmore and colleagues um, out of Boston, single center study, the EPVent1 study, was which esophageal pressure guided mechanical ventilation. And I remember I convinced uh, Deborah for me to put an esophageal balloon uh, in a patient who was quite sick with abdominal compartment syndrome, which is really the perfect patient to put this type of therapy in. Obese and abdominal compartment syndrome, if you don't have a balloon, you're really flying blind, like entirely. Um, and I remember I convinced her to put a balloon in and we put a balloon in and the balloon basically, based on the Talmore method, instructed me, if I wanted to use it properly, to put the patient's PEEP from 24, which she was already maxed out on a what we would consider 
any peep table, the maximum peep is 24 and 100%. And it basically told me she needed a peep of 32. And I remember Deborah looking at me and saying, do you trust it? <laughs> and I'm not sure I looked her directly in the eye when I said yes, uh, because in my head, I was thinking, I don't know if my ventilator can do this. I was using an Avia ventilator um, and I was pretty sure the peep could go that high, but I didn't know if I'd start seeing smoke come out the back of it. Uh, so I said, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I can do that. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe it. And she's okay. Well, let's see what happens. So she said, we have nitric outside the room. We have the oscillator outside the room. Cause we'd already brought in all this stuff and I convinced her to let me try a balloon first. And what was insane. And I, I know, I know for a fact that you've seen the, this magic happen before Dean, but we put the peep from 24 to 32. And what was crazy is the, so the driving pressure at the time we were using pressure control. So I didn't have to change her pressure control, which right away told you that you probably weren't over distending the lung if the volumes were still okay, um, which was a shock. And I remember turning that peep up to 32. And I remember all of us just looking and watching the sats go from 85 where they had been for an hour and watching them go up 88, 89, 90, 92. And we're just all staring at the monitor and we're also looking at the blood pressure, which wasn't budging at all. Like nothing, like there was no, no impact. Sure, and it really, the patient's intrathoracic pressure was, was already well, that high to begin with. Exactly. So we're not, we weren't really increasing it. We were just matching it. And yeah, yeah. it was just, it was phenomenal to see. And I remember Deborah looked at me and she goes, you got to write this up. And so I said, well, let's see how it what happened. So what's funny is surgery wasn't going to touch this patient with a 10 foot pole because they were on PIPA 24 and hundred percent within yeah. six hours. We had the patient down to 40% FiO2 and we called them back. We didn't tell them what peep she was on. We just called them back and they came in and they said, Oh, you know what? We'll do a bedside ultrasound and see, see what it's showing. Cause we knew she had compartment syndrome, but basically they found a collection. They, they could probably drain at the bedside and they drained, I believe two liters, the first shot and then one liter per day for the next few days. And we just kept managing her, her peep with the esophageal balloon, which on the Avia ventilator was live. Like it told us transpulmonary pressure at end exhalation. We, the graph was there. So it was actually very simple for us to do. And so when all said was said and done, she goes, I wasn't kidding. You need to write this up. Like you should submit a poster. She goes, submit it to respiratory care. And so I did. I submitted this poster, this abstract. And I remember I brought this poster. So this is my first time at AARC. Um, I knew I was getting interested in research. Um, the process of submitting this was interesting. I'm like, okay, cool. I submitted an abstract. I got a letter saying it got accepted for AERC. You just got to find your way down here and bring your poster. And I said, okay, I'll do it. So paid my way, went down there, got in the room, set up my, my poster. And I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be my first time speaking in the United States as an RT at the AARC. And I only got five minutes. I can do this as long as nobody asks me any questions. I'll be all right. So then it's my turn to talk. And right before the speaking starts, who walks in the room? But you, <laughs> you walked in. I don't remember who you were with. But again, as a young respiratory therapy nerd, I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, that's Dean Hess. Because you're pretty recognizable. I mean, you've had that mustache for quite a while. I'm like, that's, that's Dean Hess. And uh, so, okay, you walk in, you sit down, I get up, I do my five minute spiel. And then um, I think uh, Doug Pearson, I think, was the uh, Dr. Doug Pearson, Dave, I think Dave was Pearson. Dave Pearson. Yeah, Dave Pearson. Sorry. He yeah, was yeah. The, um, the moderator. And he's like, OK, do we have any questions for Tom? And uh, <laughs> the only hand in the whole room that goes up is yours. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure my hands just started to drip water out of my palms. Uh, like, oh, my God, what's he going to say? And really, I remember you asked me a question. You said, you know, this is a very interesting case. Um, can you maybe comment on the sometimes difficult nature of placing an esophageal balloon? Because I made it sound very easy in my presentation. And by that time I had put, cause this was now like, you know, November, December or something. And the case actually happened early on. I think it was in April. Um, so I made a comment saying, yep, yeah, it can be challenging at first, particularly with the catheters that came with this ventilator. Uh, if you weren't using the feeding tube, it was very challenging, very flimsy catheter, no guide wire. Um, so I had that comment and then is there any other questions and th nobody had any more questions and I was just like, okay, that wasn't that bad. And then, the, so then I submitted this paper, but at that conference, really, I just went around and saw every talk that you gave and every talk that Bob gave. This is not from then. This is from a more, more recent Congress, but just it's a re recent picture I saw of, of, uh, of Bob speaking. And I just remember being blown away at the way that 
the the evidence based medicine that you were presenting just flew out of your mouth and off the top of your head because you knew your stuff. And to me, it was like, okay, so I can read papers, but do I really un do I understand my papers enough to be able to stand up in front of people? And if I get asked a question, to just answer it with confidence. And that really, really drove me to learn a number of things. So one thing I started asking people like Dr. Deborah Cook, I started asking her to explain to me confidence intervals because you and Bob would speak and say, well, the confidence interval, this and that, and I'm sitting right in a confidence interval. I don't know what the hell that is, right? So I would write these things down and we weren't, I mean, when I went to school, we had a research course, but they're teaching you how to read, basically how to read an abstract. Like they weren't really teaching you methods and statistical data and how to interpret. We all knew the P value. Yeah, we all knew the P value and means and medians, but no one understood a confidence interval. So I remember asking Deborah to explain it to me and she was very, very kind and helped me to understand that. And then I started really understanding more depth into the papers I'm reading. So I would start looking specifically at the methods and then reading the discussion because the discussion part, which most people look, overlook in a study, the discussion will tell you all the studies that, look, that were similar to theirs or different than theirs and why they were different or why they think so. And then you'd have a next study to read. So I'd start just have this train of reading new papers based on discussions. And I quickly became obsessed with reading research papers, but 100% because of the talks I saw of you and Bob at the AARC. So eventually- um, well, That's very flattering. If, if you can back up to that last slide. Yeah, of course. So it's an opportunity to point a few things out about uh, Bob. One, yeah, and his interest which, here. I was actually, I'm glad you told me to stop because I was going to mention it, but I'll let you, I know what you're going to say. Well, yeah. what, one of the things is that, uh, that Bob like to use exclamation points. And <laughs> <laughs> that was not what I thought you were going to say, but maybe you have more. <laughs> and he, and he, uh, and he liked to use them in triplicate. And I got many emails from Bob over the years with exclamation points in the subject line. And I could uh, kind of get a sense of what his mood was when he wrote the email by whether there were one, two, or three exclamation <laughs> points in the subject line. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit of a humorous thing about Bob. But the other thing uh, that is on this slide, which is really so true for Bob, is a second bullet that says, be willing to work hard. Yep. Nobody ever worked any harder than Bob. Yeah, Bob would always be the first one to the office in the morning. So I would typically show up at 6.30 in the morning and Bob sometimes had been there for an hour, an hour and a half already. And then he would tell me, well, I'm working on this paper, I'm working on this chapter. So uh, I got up at three o'clock, I worked on it for a couple of hours and then I came to work. So, uh, so one of Bob's points that he often made was uh, this, this stuff, doesn't come easy for any of us. Uh, we all have to work hard. I mean, you had to work hard to uh, figure out confidence intervals. <laughs> I well, did. You know? yes. So we, so we, but we I've all. I've written books now, so I can continue to learn about them. Yeah, but we all did. You know. Yeah. So Bob Kesmerick and Dean Hess and Thomas Perrine, none of us were born with this knowledge in our heads. Oh, we, I'm so we, glad you said that. I'm so we glad had you said to that. Work Dean, hard yeah. to get there. And yeah. uh, so be willing to work hard. Three exclamation points is just a really important uh, a bit of advice that that Bob uh, can leave us with. Uh, you know, yeah. it's, uh, you know, I and thought you were going to comment on the fact that all of his slides had the blue background. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> and some and usually yellow print. And I remember watching him sometimes going, Bob, come on, man, you, you got to update your slide deck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, another thing about Bob and I say this, you know, uh, uh, you know, not, you, you know, I don't, I don't mean this to be taken in the wrong way, but uh, long after many of us had started to, uh, make our slides on the computer. And we even had at the MGH, we had a, a camera that was attached to a computer <laughs> that we used specifically to make slides using Harvard graphics. I don't know if anybody ever remembers that program, but that's mm -hmm. kind of before PowerPoint. Uh, but Bob insisted on having his slides typed out on a typewriter 
So he would have the secretary type them out on the typewriter, and then he would take them to the photo lab, and then they would make them into glass slides. So Bob <laughs> liked slides that were 35 millimeter slides, but they were glass rather than the plastic slides. And, uh, and the, they, you know, in 1985, they actually looked very good when they yeah. were projected from a slide uh, projector. But, you know, one of the things with glass slides was they would break. So <laughs> you drop uh, one, all of a sudden you've got no data for one slide. You're right. Like, oh, I gotta uh, make this one up. So you'd be watching a lecture from Bob and then all of a sudden a slide would come up that uh, look like uh, a stone just hit your windshield. <laughs> you know, it's a little shattered part across the slide. And I, I remember one time Bob and I were somewhere out of the country. I forget where it was. And uh, so Bob had his suitcase packed full of these glass slides, which was like cement in your and you're and you're carrying sir this is over the weight limit what do you have in here my slides so, so we're so we so we stop for i don't know something to eat or you know or a, a beer or something in the airport and i guess bob goes into the men's room and i said well here i'll i'll meet you at the gate i'll take your bag give me your bag so i grabbed his bag and my arm just about came out of the socket with all of those heavy glass slides uh, so, uh, so yeah, Bob, Bob took, Bob took a lot of ribbing about his, his typewritten slides and his glass slides and his blue background. But he used to always say, you guys always want to have pretty slides. I always <laughs> want to have accurate slides. Factual <laughs> slides. I, I because you can't have both, right? <laughs> And, yeah. you know, certainly, I mean, we have all seen presentations that are done where the slides are so fancy, it really distracts from the message. Oh, the point so, is lost. Yeah, I, I yeah, agree. Yeah, I try yeah. to keep so, most of my slides completely simple. Yeah, and I, I've, I've gone from, you know, 20 years ago, I probably tried to be too clever with my slides for a while. And I really got away from that over the years because... I don't want people focusing on uh, the cleverness in my slide. I'd rather have people focusing on what I'm trying to what I'm trying yeah. to tell them. Yeah, I've really tried to move away from having a lot of text on my slides. Like I'll have yeah. the picture of a graph or figures from a paper just to make a point. Um, yeah, and I may, yeah. I may I may reference the graph, but I don't want people sitting there trying to read every point on a slide or trying to write it down. I want them really to listen. And usually, what happens now is I try to provide my slides to people, unless I'm at a conference where they're doing that already. Right, um, right, 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 right. But and I really, I really want to go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I think one of the things that I learned from Bob about presenting, and and I've seen probably saw hundreds, maybe thousands of lectures that Bob did over over 40 years and Bob always told a, told a, uh, told a story. So mm -hmm. it was like he started at the beginning and he told a story that ended with his last slide. And one of the things that I have tried to tell people who are maybe new at this and preparing their first presentation and they wanna know, what should I do? How should, how should I put the, and I tell them, you know, just tell a story, you know, how would you explain this in the MICU uh, at the bedside? Tell right. that story and uh, use your slides to supplement your story, not yeah. to themselves, just be the story. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, <clears throat> I just want to come back to the one point you made, Dean, because I think um, I'm glad you said it because I feel like I can't be the only one who's given this as an excuse. But when people comment on um, either what you've done or uh, how I'm, you know, I'm going to use air quotes, when the people say like, how are you so smart or you're so smart? And I mean, <clears throat> at least you have a PhD beside your name, but I don't. But we know that your PhD is what is not what made you smart. It's the fact that you worked hard, you read. And if you don't understand what you're reading, the first step is just to learn how to understand what you're reading. But then really all you have to do is read like you put in a lot of work for your PhD and I'm not I'm not downplaying that. But my point is 
that's not what made you smart. I'm guessing because I'm guessing you got your PhD because of your hard work and ability to read and understand. And like you, you know, people don't have to, they have to realize that you're only as smart as you let yourself be. So you can either learn how to interpret research and be very good at reading it and critiquing it, um, not just reading it and then not realizing where the flaws are. Like you have to be able to critique it. And that is a skill, but it's actually a much easier to skill to learn, I think, than most people think. And maybe you disagree or agree, but I think if most people put in the effort to learn how to critique and understand research, I think they would find it's not actually that hard to do. Correct. Yes. And uh, <laughs> the other, this also makes me think of something else. So, you know, so people will ask, well, how do you get to be a good author, a good writer, a good researcher? How do you develop those skills? And the response <laughs> that I often give is you have to read a lot. So yeah. when you read a lot of papers and you read them in a critical way and you focus on the methods rather than just reading the abstract, then mm -hmm. you start to uh, then you start to learn how how the research was done and you start to learn how the paper was written. And the kinds of types of language that are used yep. in paper. How so science is communicated, right? I mean, exactly, exactly. I couldn't write another Harry Potter novel <laughs> because I just, I, I don't read. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I know, I don't read that type of content enough to be able to be comfortable in trying to speak that language. And I think, you, you know, you brought up a good point that if you read a little lot, you start to realize how science is communicated, in particular, the science related to what we do. We learn how this is communicated. And like, you're right, like I, I could sit down and write a manuscript now, but it's only because I've read so many manuscripts that it just come, and it doesn't mean that you know how to plagiarize an article. It just means you know how it's spoken. You can now, it's like learning a language that is in your language. It's just yeah, learning yeah. a different way. Even papers that are submitted <clears throat> to respiratory care, where I put on my editor's hat, uh, sometimes the 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 research, the methodology is okay, and the data analysis is okay, but it's just not written in the style of a scientific paper. Right. So I will ask the authors to. Uh, to review recent issues of respiratory care to see the style of the papers yep. that we publish. Uh, and then to also, much as you did with Deb Cook, to find someone who has done this before, someone right. who has been through the process, knows how to write the paper, who can help to prepare the paper in the style of a scientific paper. Yep. I remember when I gave Deborah my my uh, sample manuscript. So this was my first publication. It was in respiratory care. It was the case report of that poster. And I remember giving it to her. And I actually got excited when she returned it that she didn't edit too much of it. I was worried that she would edit a lot of it. But she didn't edit too much of it, I think, because she realized I had read it. So in preparation for this, I started looking for a bunch of case reports on respiratory care and started reading them and just understanding how these were written. Because you can look at the author guidelines, but they don't give you examples enough to know that how these things are presented. So I'm, I realized, okay, there's an introduction, there's a this, there's a that. And I remember she edited it. And the first, the one thing I knew for a fact she edited is she put the word sequelae in there. She said there was no adverse sequelae. And I'm like, I don't know what sequelae is. <laughs> I had to look it up. And basically, it's just like adverse events. There is no adverse like events. There's no harmful things that happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I just, I remember seeing that and going, okay, well, if this is as hard as it's going to be, that's that's fine. I can take it. But then you go through the peer review process, which case reports also went under peer review. And I remember getting the notification back that there were some uh, mi minor revisions. And I remember at first thinking, oh man, this is going to be tough. And actually it wasn't that bad. Again, this was a case report. Now, after this, I published a first author paper with uh, Anise Cindy, um, who was a fellow at our hospital and it was esophageal pressure in the um, operating room like compared to abdominal pressures. And I remember that process was a bit harder because when the peer review process came back and basically suggested that, um, that we make a focus on the article because we were kind of going in two different directions and the, the guidance that came back was try to focus it. And it, it got published as well, but it was a little more heartache. But I remember the first time I met uh, Dr. Talmor, Danny Talmor, who was the first author of the first esophageal balloon study, I met him at a conference 
and I think you were speaking at it. It was like yes, it was, it was in by, Orlando, Florida. I remember. Yeah, it was hosted by Care Fusion, right? Yeah, I yeah. think that was the first time I met you. It was the first time I met. Uh, well, sorry, yeah, because you had asked me a question <laughs> at the conference, but I hadn't met you then. But then I met you at that um, talk in uh, in Orlando, and I remember introducing myself to Danny, and he said to me, "He goes, oh yeah, I know who you are," and I went. You do and he goes oh i peer reviewed your article and i went you know like <laughs> i'm like i in my head i'm like if i knew you were the peer review author of my case report i'm not sure i would have even submitted it <laughs> like i just would have assumed that he was going to tear it apart but so i was happy to know that he he was you know Im 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 impressed by the the um, the the case report and i know respiratory care no longer accepts case reports because i used to encourage all of my students to really pay close attention to cases and i said if you ever see a really cool case that's really impactful i said you can write it up and submit it some journals still accept case reports but uh i know that it would definitely help me get on my way so yeah, when well, i remember the journal saying they weren't going to do it i understood why because I'm, I'm now on the editorial board for respiratory care <laughs> fast fast forward a bit a couple more years in my career but um so i understand based on you know because we sit through the editorial board meetings and i understand the reason why but i think for some new authors it was really it really was a stepping stone to be honest yeah, it's well, almost like there should be a separate journal just for case reports for new authors, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, one of the problems with case reports is this one that you show is an example of, of a very good one. Uh, there, well, you. there. So you were, chose it as one of the top five that year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, uh, but for every good one like this that we have gotten, there have been far, far, far too many that are just not very good. Yeah, they're not they're not publish worthy. Yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. But I, I'll tell you a funny story uh, about uh, Bob again. Uh, is you said that <clears throat> that book added the word sequelae, and you had to look it up. Well, back in the early 1990s, Bob was invited to do the program committee lecture at the AARC, and uh, that. Today is the Kittredge Lecture, which I think mm. you just did last year. Yeah, I did, yeah. So Bob did that many, many, many years ago when it was called the Program Committee Lecture. And the topic that he was asked to use was carpe diem. Oh, right. And <laughs> Bob, <laughs> so Bob, Bob didn't know what the word meant. Yeah, but he's an he's he hadn't watched Dead Poet Society yet, <laughs> it, right? So this was from the right from the movie. So, but Bob hadn't seen the movie, he didn't know what Carpe Diem meant, but he didn't want to. He's invited to do this honor lecture and doesn't want to say, "Well, I'll do the talk, but I don't know the Latin." <laughs> so, right. So he he's like, "Sure, up, I'll do it." <laughs> so he ended up sending his wife to the library yeah. so she could look up Carpe Diem. So I remember you telling me, because this is prior to having like easy access to the internet to look something yeah, up. Like yeah, now yeah. you could find out what Carpe Diem means in about or, 10 seconds. Or, correct. So, I mean, that, that I think that also <clears throat> sort of speaks to the, uh, to Bob's humility. And in fact, when he wrote up that paper, which got published in respiratory care, just as your Kittredge lecture will be published in respiratory yeah, it, care. It just got accepted it, yesterday, actually. It just oh, got yeah, approved so yesterday. I think that's coming out this summer. July, uh, yeah. But, uh, but in the paper, Bob actually talks about how I was invited to do this lecture. I didn't, didn't even know what the word meant. I had to send right. my wife to the library to figure out what the Latin words meant. And then, of course, he proceeds at the lecture to, you know, deliver this brilliant presentation yeah. about uh, respiratory care and seizing the day and so forth. Yeah. So I remember I'm going to tell another quick story. So the first time I saw Bob speak in Canada, I actually think it might have been the only time I saw him speak in Canada because I know he had spoken, had spoken before in Canada, but um, I said speaking, spoken before in Canada. But the time that I saw him, I remember going up and uh, introducing myself to him. And uh, he said, uh, oh, nice to meet you. And then I, I was talking about, I think we got on the topic of EIT because I had I'd started using EIT. This was in 2013 um, and I was very excited about it. So obviously I just wanted to talk to another person who would probably know what EIT is. And I spoke to him about it. And then I remember at the end of our conversation, which was maybe five minutes, it wasn't that long that he got to know me. Uh, but he stopped, looked at me, he goes, you ever authored anything before? 
And I said, actually, yeah, I have a couple of uh, I have a couple of publications in respiratory care now. And he goes, oh, I'm I'm sorry. What was your last name? I did, I, did, I didn't recognize it. So I, t I told him my name. And then he goes, okay. And he goes, would you uh, do you think we think you would ever consider writing a chapter in Egan's? <laughs> I'm like, uh, like the Egan's, like the Bible of respiratory therapy. He's like, yeah. He's like, I don't think I said those words. That was in my head. I just said like Egan's respite, like fundamentals of respiratory care. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, yeah, of course, of course I would. Um, so we parted ways. I actually didn't think anything of it. I thought he might ask that of everyone he meets. I don't know. This is my first time meeting him. Maybe he's just trying to gather a bunch of uh, ideas about uh, authors, but I'll let you tell your little side story about this, Dean, and then I'm going to say the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I then I re recall uh, that uh, Bob came back uh, to the MGH having attended this meeting in Canada. And uh, he comes into my office and he says, uh, do you do you know this guy, Thomas Pirano Perino? And I said, oh, yeah, I know. Tom. I know Thomas. And he said, uh, uh, well, he he, he seems like uh, like a nice guy. I, I have a project for him. Do you know his email address? So, <laughs> so I'm glad because I gave him a card, but he probably had many cards given to him while he was up there. And yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad he I'm glad he worked with you and you knew how to get in contact with me. But yeah, that that turned into me authoring a chapter in uh, Egan's Fundamentals of Respiratory Care ed edition 11. And then edition 12 is now published this year, I believe, or maybe late last year. Um, but yeah, it, it just came out. Um, so yeah, it really, it really led to, um, a, a amazing opportunity for me, like to, you know, as a highlight of a career as a respiratory therapist to say you authored something in Egan's is like, you know, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty nerd worthy accomplishment. Like it's a thing to be proud of. Like I'll never read the book again <laughs> because, but I had to, and I appreciate the book, but it's just one of those like, wow, I can't believe, you know, I have a, a chapter in that. So I, I really thank, you know, I, I owe Bob that. And it's funny because, <clears throat> after this, then I could start seeing Bob at AARC and say, hey, Bob. And then he'd start remembering me and say, oh, hey, Tom, how are you? I remember saying hi to you once in the hallway and I'd grown a beard and got glasses and you didn't recognize me at first. And then I said, I do recall that. It's, Tom, it's Tom Perino from Canada. And you went, oh, you're in disguise. <laughs> right. That, that was exactly that was in Tampa. I can recall I was talking to somebody at the bottom of an escalator. Yeah. And there's this guy coming down the escalator and he's waving at me like, you know, Again, who is this person? And there was Thomas with a beard. Yeah, yeah, because I hadn't grown one yet, and then I, I, I eventually at one point had quite, <laughs> quite a large beard. Um, but yeah, so that I, I remember that, and then so then Bob started recognizing me. Uh, the first time I saw him, I think I had to remind him, um, Tom Canada Egan's. He's like, oh right, right, right. I mean, I never took it personally from you or Bob because I can only imagine how many people come up and introduce themselves to you because you guys really are rock stars in the world of respiratory care, and you've put in your your dues. You deserve that for sure. Um, some of them would come up to me and say Bob, and some of them would come up to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I, I haven't been called Dean yet or Bob, and I'm not sure that will happen. Uh, although you and I had a fun experience. This was uh, two years ago now um, where we did a pro-con debate. And uh, so first off, you mentioned earlier before we, we came on live that you had up until the last AARC live conference, you had never done a pro con with, with Bob. You had basically, you guys had refused either because maybe it would just make it awkward when you come into work on Monday <laughs> after the conference, but it really just had never done it. And then finally the last year you did it. And it was actually a day after you and I had this battle, which uh, <laughs> I, I remember posting on Twitter and I, it got, I still it got have that tattoo. Oh yeah. I bet. <laughs> And then so, we, I mean, you and I did a pro-con debate. It was high, And this was funny. When I first got asked to do the pro-con debate, I'm like, uh, I get the, the email that says, we'd like you to do a pro-con debate with Dean Hess. And I'm like, okay. And then it was, so first off, I didn't know. I'm like, this is either because I've now made it to the big leagues or they're trying to punish me for something I wasn't aware of. Um, because I'm like, oh man, I got to go up against literally the heavyweight of, of Dean Hess. And I remember the subject was high flow nasal cannula and your argument was pro um, for, no, so, sorry. It was for high flow nasal cannula for hypercarbic respiratory failure, where we really yeah, don't well, have well, a lot of data. High flow nasal cannula versus NIV. So I argued right. that we should use NIV 
for right. COPD exacerbation. <laughs> that's that, that's what it was. To, uh, to argue that we should use high flow nasal cannula. Right. So and Dean I, had I, to argue to say, the gold standard say, recommendation. I'm glad that I got my, my the NIV. Yeah. So basically, Dean got to argue the strongest evidence we have for non-invasive ventilation at the moment. And I had to argue the least amount of uh, our data we had for high flow nasal cannula. So basically, I, d I remember emailing you and said, I hope you're ready for a 30 minute stand up comedian act because I don't know what else I'm going to present. And really, it, it did kind of turn into I, I, I again, I'll say this because I'm biased, but you've also seen many pro-con debates, but I honestly think this was probably one of the best pro-con debates there's ever been. And I'm just, I'm not just saying that because I was in it. I'm saying like your response, because I think I went first, right? Could have been. I don't recall. I, I can't remember if you went or I went, but anyways, I just remember the back and forth was, was hilarious. We both cracked little jokes here and there. I had a couple of pictures and it was just, it was just a really, really good time. And this is, you know, I never had an opportunity to do this with Bob. I'm not sure. I, I felt like my relationships between you and Bob, Bob felt to me like more like the, um, more like the boss. Cause like, I mean, I, he's the editor of a, uh, you know, a textbook that I have to author. Whereas like you had become more of a colleague and I had to spend a bit more time with you. Uh, and then the journal conferences, you were both there, but I felt like you were a bit more playful. So I'm glad it was you that they chose. But then the very next day you had to go up against Dean or sorry, you had to go up against Bob for to tell the story because yeah, yeah, you basically yeah. so, had to know our uh, anyway, yeah so so first of all the the pro con that you and i did was was a lot of fun and i also think that it was i think it was helpful to the audience because we did cover the evidence and we talked about the strengths and the limitations of the available evidence and we tried to make it uh uh clinical so that people yeah we didn't want people to leave confused and not sure what to do which right, i think sometimes right, right. people feel but, that way but we also did not take one another too seriously so right. uh and we knew one another well enough that uh that i knew i could make jokes about you you knew you could make jokes about me the audience could have a good laugh and mm -hmm. you know it was so i think it was informational and it was also entertaining yeah. Uh, so at the same mm -hmm. meeting, Bob and I finally did agree to do a pro con. And uh, the topic was high flow nasal cannula versus non invasive ventilation for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And I was given the side of arguing for high flow nasal cannula. So again, I felt as though I got the better part of the deal. Uh, <laughs> You, you are correct. Uh, uh, we did not have the same degree of, uh, you know, poking little bits of fun at one another and so forth. And right. part of that might be because I think you used the right words. I mean, Bob was my boss. He was yeah, my yeah. boss. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I felt like he was my boss for the authorship, which so, I wasn't going to mess that one know, up by making so, fun of him. <laughs> so this is the guy who wrote my annual evaluation. So yeah. Oh, that's so, funny. Uh, but, uh, but it was a, it was a good uh, debate. I think, again, we were both able to present the strengths and the limitations on both sides of the argument as it turns out, that was the AERC in New Orleans, yeah. which was the last, the last time, live one. Yeah. Last live AARC. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, and Bob is gone now. So I'm really pleased that we did both agree that we would yeah. do it. You finally did it. Yeah. 19, so I'm really. After years glad. of saying, no, 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 we're not. Cause I'm like yeah, you said, yeah, you were yeah, asked right. many times, I'm sure. So, for example, you know, they would, I remember one year, they wanted Bob and me to debate recruitment maneuvers. Well, Bob was not going to take the con side of that, for sure, because he was a career-long advocate. Yeah, he's for all for recruitment. it. And I certainly was not going to take the con side against Bob, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> that would be, you know, that would be very very awkward uh, yeah like you said uh, he literally was your boss <laughs> like he like literally was it's not boss. even a feeling it's like he, he literally was your boss he wasn't just the textbook editor he was yeah. he wrote my evaluation so right. yeah. uh 
any rate, uh, and you know, I should also point out, you know, that that Bob and I also did a book together that you may or may not be familiar with, but we we wrote a mechanical ventilation uh, book together, which is now in I think the fourth or the fifth edition. I think it's in the fourth edition. So, mm -hmm. I so think I remember, uh, yeah. So Bob Bob and I. Uh, you know, worked together on a lot of things over yeah. the years, uh, you know, which doesn't even touch on all of the work we did together managing the respiratory care department at the mm -hmm. MGH. So, yeah. so yeah, it would have been quite awkward for us to <laughs> to argue a topic, particularly a topic that Bob was very impassioned about. That would have been right. extremely awkward. Oh, for sure. So I'm, I'm going to play a video that somebody shared. But first, we just have a couple of comments. People really want to let you know how much you mean to them, uh, Dean. So people just uh, this is from Salim. He's saying um, he's saying, please say hello to Dr. Dean Hess from Salim. Um, I will meet him next AARC uh, Congress 2021 in Arizona. Well, I because plan he's hoping hopefully uh, hopefully Salim uh, <laughs> international travel will allow you to be there. I think things are starting to get better on that front. But uh, for example, I can't fly to to Canada to see Thomas, nor can he fly to Boston to see me right now because I believe Tom Tom the the border's still closed. I think it is. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So hopefully that will improve before uh, the Congress this year. Yeah, and then another one here from Greg. Uh, Dr. Hess, really enjoyed learning from you at Northeastern uh, during my master's of respiratory care. Oh, Greg. Well, good to hear from you again. Yes, Greg uh, took one of my courses a couple of years ago. I think it was the adult critical care course, although I also teach a pulmonary disease course. So uh, I don't recall which it was. Maybe it was both of them. But Greg, good to hear from you again. I hope things are going well. Yeah. And so I, he's, an, uh, he's an RT here in Ontario. Um, he's I, one I of the instructors say, at yeah, Fanshawe College. Uh, yeah, he's from the, uh, uh, is he from the, uh, Greg, from the Toronto area? I know he's from Ontario. L L London, Ontario. He's one of the instructors oh, okay. so at the Fanshawe old, College. Your old stomping ground, right? Yeah, that's where I went to school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, one of the things, so one of the things I did get to do uh, with Bob uh, professionally, at least at the conference, uh, was actually um, at least not a pro-con debate, but I had to moderate one of his sessions which basically means you don't have to do much because uh, if someone asks a question, you know, with, with some, I would say, inexperienced presenters, if someone asks a question and the presenter kind of stumbles with it, the moderator is really there to sort of smooth things out, maybe offer some, some answers uh, to that question if the, you know, if the presenter is, is, is a bit mixed up. So I'm going to play a video that I found that someone shared on the AARC uh, Clinical Connect in the critical care group. Just, it's just basically demonstrating the wisdom that is uh, that is Bob. And what what's funny is um, I I'm just standing there <laughs> doing nothing because I didn't have to say anything. And what's funny is what was going through my head. So he's talking about he the video starts with him talking about PAV plus and the work of breathing bar on on PAV plus. And we're doing a large randomized control trial of PAV. Uh, PAV plus versus pressure support. It's a multi-center study. And I'm one of the RT leads for that for that study. The principal investigators are both uh, Dr. Karen Burns and Dr. Laurent Burchard. And so while he's talking about the worker breathing bar in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, we don't use that. We use this PMUS table that uh, Dr. Burchard did with uh, Carto and colleagues, and it was published. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so as that's going through my head, Bob just goes right in and explains that. He looks at me and he goes, actually, Laurent. And I'm just like... I I have nothing to do up here. Like that was the one thing I'm like, oh, I can add this when he's done talking. Didn't have to. <laughs> it just wasn't necessary. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share this now because this is pretty pretty entertaining here. Now, hopefully you can hear the audio. <clears throat> it's a little bit quiet. I do know that. We when we use PAP Plus, we base it on the work of breathing bar that you have, you know, on the ventilators. And maybe my assumptions are incorrect, but at least in our measurements. <clears throat> If the work of breathing is in the 0.3 to 0.7 range, which is what you're doing now, bills per liter, I assume that the driving pressure is reasonable. Now, that could be a wrong assumption. You also have data that Laurent published a few years ago to look at the 
you know, the, the pressure generated to de develop the pressure time product, and he's actually put together a table that keeps that active, that shows you settings to keep the active patient inspiratory effort between five and 10 centimeters of water, which means your driving pressure is going to be you know, relatively low if it stays in that particular range. So I think we have some data and some guidance, but clearly you can't get the precision that you can establish when the patient's under control mechanical ventilation. But I always tell the staff, look at the patient. If the patient looks like they're struggling, I don't care what the data says, we're probably not ventilating that patient appropriately. You know, if they're using accessory muscles, they got retractions, you know, they're tachycardic, they're, they're, their blood pressure is up or down or whatever, then we're, we're doing something wrong. And we need to go back and figure out what that is, no matter, you know, what the data is. So I don't think that's the important aspect, is not excluding our individual assessment of the patient. Uh, unmute myself for a second. I know another thing. So this was basically two questions that was asked for them. I think one was asked about the PAV. And then I think someone also asked a question about um, mode selection. And I remember in my head thinking like, I wonder what he's going to say, because I mean, we use, I was at this time of this video, I was working at uh, St. Michael's in Toronto and all of our passive patients are placed on volume assist control for the purpose of actually, we set that inspiratory pause of 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 seconds using volume assist control. We have a real time readout of plateau pressure. We know driving pressure. We, we document driving pressure routinely. And, um, but the minute someone is breathing and we also use flows of 50 to 60 liters per minute. So when someone does start to breathe, they don't normally automatically get flow desynchronous. So we can usually acknowledge that they're breathing and then transition them to a pressure targeted mode, which that was our gold standard. So the next part of the video, he starts talking about, um, modes and he's like, when you're passive, basically it doesn't matter what you use volume pressure doesn't matter and he says but when somebody wakes up you know the last mode i would use would be a volume control mode because of the lack of variability so it was just i mean this was really bob in a nutshell like you, you, even if you were moderating one of his sessions you could think like well what could i add to this conversation you didn't need to like i literally stand i was just standing there saying this is like the easiest moderation like can you always have me moderate Bob, because I didn't have to do anything except just point to the next person who had a question. It was pretty straightforward. All right. So to see if we have any more, uh, is there a, a account in Facebook for Dr. Hess? I don't think you have an official page, like a, a page for yourself, correct? I think you, you may have a personal account. Yeah, but I, don't I, have think a, you have I have a personal page. Yeah. Right. Cause I'm broadcasting this to my, it's like a, a person. Like it's not my, it's not my personal Facebook account. It's like a person. I'm also streaming this to YouTube as well. Um, so, you know what, I'm going to open it up, uh, Dean. I, I really just wanted to talk about just with you about Bob and his legacy and have some fun and even just talk about how you and Bob both have influenced my career. Um, again, just the fact, I mean, me publishing in respiratory care, even getting on the editorial board, I have a feeling you had something to do with that. Um, uh, so just getting, you know, that opportunity, um, being on the program almost every year now at AARC is really, it's been an honor. Mind you, again, it's so funny because people can say, oh, he speaks at AARC every year. People don't realize how hard it is to actually prepare because the you we submit talks. We don't like, there. so I have been invited to provide some lectures for sure. Uh, like the Phil Kittredge Memorial Lecture, I was invited to give that lecture and I was invited to give other lectures over the years. Um, but I'm submitting symposiums, like two, like two or three talks um, as a symposium, and then usually doing double that just because to increase my chances. And usually I'm trying to bring somebody along with me. So as you know, every year I submit talks, it's me and Dr. Eddie Fan. We just have a long lasting relationship. When he was a fellow, I was a respiratory therapist. Um, and we, we spent a lot of time discussing science and mechanical ventilation. So we just have this friendship that every year I submit talks, I quickly message him just to make sure he'll be available. I say, hey, the AARC dates are this. Do you think you're available? And he goes, yeah, it looks like I'm available now. I said, okay, I'll submit talks. And, and, and then he always does great talks too. Oh, so. fantastic. Fantastic. Like, you know, absolutely great. And then two years ago, I had a colleague um, from Chile, uh, Felipe Damiani, who was a, again, a research fellow up in our research lab. And I remember him saying one day, he goes, oh, it's always been my dream to just attend the AARC. I've always wanted to attend the AARC. And I said, would you do a talk? 
because he had to present at our lab meeting. So I knew his English was, I mean, his English is fine. It's, it's, it's great. But some people feel like nervous if they're going to present, if their English is not their first language. And I knew his English as a first, as a second language was good enough to present. And uh, he always presented really well in the lab meetings. So I said, well, would you do a talk? And he goes, oh, you think they would like, do you think they would let me talk? And I said, listen, I submit talks. I have submitted talks every year for the last 10 years. <laughs> I'm like, they usually accept most of my talks, not always, but I said, you know, if I put a symposium with you and I down and it's a solid symposium, I said, yeah, they'll let you talk. It doesn't matter if you've never been there. I said, this is your opportunity. So I remember when we got the email that our talks got uh, accepted for that year, which I think was the, was 2019. Yeah. That was the first year he presented. Um, and he was just like, just blown away. He was like, this is the best, like going to AARC in New Orleans, getting to see you speak. Like, I remember him watching our pro con debate and just this huge smile on his face. Like he was just so excited to be there. Um, and then I submitted talks with him and myself and Eddie, um, this for the last live where we had it online last year. Um, and again, they got accepted. He got to speak and did a fantastic job. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really been quite a, quite a journey. And it's really unfortunate that, you know, the last live session we had uh, was in New Orleans. And that was the last time that we we're going to see Bob present at these conferences, oh, yeah. because yeah. it was always that I always had circled him on the agenda, right? Like you, you just had and to a see lot of, a lot of other people. <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, his, his sessions were almost always, um, you know, were always very well attended. Um, I can probably tell you one of my favorite, and this may ruffle some feathers on anybody watching the broadcast, but one of my favorite pro cons I've ever seen was Bob and Dr. Habashi talking about APRV. <laughs> and I mean, we don't need to get into it. Most people that have watched my Facebook lives have heard my opinions that we need more data for APRV before people are using it the way that they're using it because we don't have that data. Um, and he made this point in front of a pat, like there was standing room only. Uh, were you at that pro con debate? No, no, but I've heard many stories about it. Oh, it was a, so it was literally standing room only. I was standing at the back of the room because by the time I got there, there was no seats. And I remember him, like it wasn't just, like when you and I did it, it was you went, I went, and then we discussed. It was, he went, Dr. Habashi went, Bob rebuttal. It was just, it was rebuttals. Like there was, it wasn't like ours. We were trying to get people to come together. It was like, this is what I think. This is what I think. And they were not even close, right? And I remember Bob looking at the audience and saying, so you've demonstrated some really intriguing data on animals in the lab managing them before they get ARDS and he goes and he points to the audience and he goes like this he goes but that's not now that's not how any of you are using APRV clinically and like I'm just like can he just take the mic and drop it now because that really is an important point I think right because much of the intriguing data with APRV that they will push themselves is let's avoid ARDS with APRV. They negate the fact that the animals are 30 liters positive <laughs> and they probably would never be able to wean them off of mechanical ventilation, but the lungs look nice. Um, but anyways, the fact that he pointed that out, just saying like, you know, everyone who's pro APRV, everyone's using it as a rescue strategy right now. Nobody's using it as the mode when they intubate. So I shouldn't say nobody, obviously places where Habashi works, if he's on, he's probably going to put people on it right off the bat. But that's not how the majority of people are using that mode. And he he made that point so clearly and so perfectly just to say, like, we don't have data to support using it the way you are all using it. And he just pointed to everybody in the audience. And I was just like, oh, man. He yeah, well, when Bob when when Bob Bob was uh, <clears throat> had when Bob would speak with conviction when he really believed in the message. And I guess kind of, as you just pointed out, he was never shy about how he said it. So nope. he was, he and Bob was unapologetic when he uh, had conviction about a certain subject. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Dean, I don't want to keep you. I said I'd keep you for an hour. We weren't sure we'd have enough to talk about for an hour, but I had a feeling we weren't going to have trouble <laughs> rambling on the both of us because we both like to talk. I always truly enjoy uh, talking to you. Obviously, um, over the years, we've I, I consider you a friend now. Uh, and I think 
as a nerd, it's pretty cool to say that Dean Hess is my friend. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> it really is a privilege. Um, but really, we're here just to acknowledge the, the wonderful and absolute work that uh, Bob has done and really the, the legacy he leaves behind. And he really does leave uh, this void. Because um, when, when I think about it as a nerd, if I think respiratory therapists, global, really, there's you and Bob when you really think about it and you can be humble and say, well, there's this person like really like <laughs> and anyone who might be getting like even remotely active in their career, you guys have minimum 20 years on any of them. Right. And this really is like, there's obviously a new generation of very, very bright RTs, many of them in the United States getting their PhDs. Uh, I know a number of colleagues that got to meet from, from the, from the U S as well. And they're all, they're all on their way. But I mean, you guys have like, like I said, minimum of 20 years paved in front of them that really opened the doors for many opportunities as well. And uh, I really, I appreciate what you've done and what uh, Bob has done. And I really thank you for coming on and joining, joining me here. Well, that's, that's nice of you to say. It certainly helps when you have a head start. <laughs> when you're spotted <laughs> 20 years, that helps. Uh, I mean, I'll just say that, you know, Bob without question will be, will be missed. Uh, but uh, he will not be forgotten. Nope. And uh, we can, we'll be speaking fondly about him for many years to come. We'll be talking about uh, how he influenced us when we read his work and how he influenced us when we went to his lectures and be able to have, like we did in this program, uh, some chuckles yep. about the yep. side of Bob that... Uh, that we will also remember fondly. Yeah, a lot of people don't know he loves cowboy boots. Correct. <laughs> he loves cowboy boots. He would show yeah, up to the journal I, conference jeans and cowboy boots because we were instructed not to wear suits. I showed up in a Toronto Blue Jays jersey. Bob showed up in jeans and cowboy boots. <laughs> yeah, I heard those cowboy boots approaching my office thousands of times. Yeah, I imagine. Bob, Bob never snuck up on me. No, he couldn't. Not with those boots. Well, thank you so much, Dean. Uh, if you want to just hang on a moment once I say goodbye and uh, we'll have a quick uh, post chat. But thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And this will be live on uh, like it'll remain on Facebook for you to view afterwards, as well as my YouTube channel. Thank you very much for tuning in. Bye bye.